Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service here at Cornerstone Bible Church. I want to welcome you here on campus. Welcome those who are online watching us from wherever you are. And this morning, I want to start our service by inviting you to get free. To be free from yourself, free from this world, free from this system that tells you nothing you have is ever good enough because you have everything you need in Jesus Christ. So what you find in this world is you're a lie to your entire life. If you just had a little more money, you'd be satisfied. If you just had a little bigger house, you'd be satisfied. If you just lose that 10 pounds, you would be perfect. And what you find is it's never enough. Drinking of the world's water is like drinking salt water. The more you drink, the thirstier you become, and it will eventually kill you. But Christ invites you to something greater. He says, come drink of the living water. Come let my spirit flow in and out. Be content in who I am and who I am making you to be. I will take every dead thing in your life, and I will resurrect it and give you new life. I will turn your grave into a garden. So let's stand and let's sing that.
just like us, people exiled to live in a culture that is godless, that is worse than godless, and is anti-God. And it were these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they breathe three of the most powerful words in all of scripture, but if not. So they're standing before the king, and he says, you are going to worship at the foot of this world. You will worship at my feet. You will bow to my idol. And they said, listen, our God is powerful enough to deliver us from you. But even if he doesn't, we will always worship him. Do your worst. And so they got the furnace going and they made the fire so hot that the men that carried these three young men to throw them in died as they did it. But then something happened. There was another in the fire. See, Jesus was waiting right there for them. And when they came out of that fire, here's what's interesting. The things that were keeping them bound were burned away. Not a hair on their head was harmed. Christian, you are never promised not to go through the fires of life. You will. But you've been given a promise that the refiner's fire will burn away everything in you and on you that doesn't belong around you. That's what God does. There is another in the fire waiting there for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we could sing your scripture and be reminded that we are not the first to face trials and we will not be the last. We are part of something so beautiful that is so beyond this world. And I ask, Father, that you would just put eternity into our hearts this morning. That we would see the world through fresh eyes. That we'd remember, Lord, that you are sovereign over the storm. That you are with us in the fire. And that heaven is our home. And let that bring us peace this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Children can be dismissed for Children's Church at this time. It is good to see everyone this morning. Good morning. We are in the fourth message of our series based in the book of Mark, Real Faith. You know, much of modern Christianity has what the Bible would say, the appearance of godliness but none of the power thereof. We've gotten really good at living dirty, but looking clean. Like, we've gotten really good at speaking Christianese. Now, we could sound Christian, right? We speak it fluently, but our words are powerless to speak life into a dying world. And that's because what we've cultivated these past 30, 40, 50 years... Is not a biblical faith. It is a cultural faith. And it does not have the power to change things. And it's time that changes. And guess what? That change has to start with us. Right? This series is not about pointing fingers. It's about us being willing to take responsibility for our faith. Because a counterfeit faith will fall apart when times get tough. And that's what I've been watching these past few years, is America's counterfeit faith falling apart one piece 
at a time. And I don't want our testimony to be that we believed in the good news until things went bad. Like, I don't want people to see us and think that if God doesn't do good things for us, we no longer believe he is a good God. Because, listen, the gospel was never about your life always being good. The gospel says that God will always be good even when things are bad. He saved you out of your badness, not out of your goodness. See, real faith will produce real results, good, bad, and ugly, and it works better as time gets worse. It gets stronger as we grow weaker. Right? It's an inside-out kind of thing that changes us in a way that we end up changing the world around us. So, so far we've talked about repenting of our sins, because if you haven't repented of your sins yet, if you still think that you don't need to repent, you're not saved. You don't know Jesus. You need to repent. And then after you repent and you're justified, then you have to enter the process of sanctification. In other words, being less like you, more like Jesus. So you've got to learn how to resist temptation. And then you've got to do something. Follow him, not your own desires, not your spouse, right? Not what this world tells you. You have to follow the call of Jesus Christ. When you follow the Savior's call, here's what's really cool. Something supernatural happens in your life, and you'll be changed forever. So this morning, we're going to see that real faith finds the lost. And I'm going to say something that might sound controversial to our modern American ears, but would have been greatly and easily understood in the first century church. Are you ready? A disciple who doesn't make disciples isn't a real disciple. I'm going to say it again. A disciple who doesn't make disciples isn't a real disciple. Because a real faith never forgets that God's grace works on the worst of sinners. And God's mercy is needed even by the best of sinners. See, a real faith finds the lost because it doesn't forget its own faults. And we're going to unpack that this morning. So today's message is real faith finds lost people. Let's pray. Father, I approach you this morning feeling your presence. Father, knowing that even the songs that were chosen this morning, without any input from me, got your stamp of approval. That we're going to preach about your grace and mercy, and we just sang about your grace and mercy over and over and over again. Now, Father, I can't set anyone free, Father. If we're just being real this morning, Father, I put myself in bondage, so I can't set anyone else free. But you could set us all free from ourselves this morning. You could remove the things in our lives that we cannot seem to get rid of. Father, you can cleanse our hearts. You can purify our minds. So, Father, we're coming before you this morning saying, we can't, but you can and we desperately want to see you move. Father, I'm tired of the same old, same old. Father, going to church is just simply not enough. Help us to be the church, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. And God's people said, amen. amen. Mark chapter 2. We've made it to chapter 2. Mark 2. We're going to start in verse 13. If you're new or you're a visitor or you forgot your Bible this morning, there's one in this seat beneath you. If you don't own a Bible, please, 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 please take that Bible home with you. There will also be some verses on the screen behind me. Verse 13. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. This is crazy. If you know anything about the context of this verse, this is unheard of. This is crazy. Jesus is doing something so countercultural that you're going to see why he rubbed religious people the wrong way. See, a real faith never forgets that God's grace still works even in the worst 
of sinners. See, there's no one so lost in their sin that God's grace can't find them. I want you to think about the one person in your life right now, right now, that is so lost in their sin, so steeped in darkness, that your heart just breaks for them. And then I want you just to silently pray that God's grace would find them even this morning. See, Jesus went out to where lost people lived. This was a consistent rhythm in his ministry. He didn't hide out in a room with his disciples complaining about how bad the world was getting. I mean, that describes 75% of the churches in America this morning. We're just going to complain about everyone around us. The world is so bad. I mean, this is like the religious playbook. You know, the Pharisees did the same thing. You know what the Pharisees preached to? The choir. The Pharisees didn't care about lost people. Jesus went to the street corner. Jesus went to where lost people were at. That's where he was interested in doing ministry. So here's a simple biblical principle. To find a lost person. You know what you have to do? You're ready. This is profound. It's going to change your life. Maybe you didn't know. Maybe that's why we're not doing it. So I'm going to help us. To find a lost person, you know what? You first have to go looking for them. Genius. Right? Isn't that good? It was worth the price of admission today. <laughs> there is no admission, so. But if you want to, you know, anyway. <laughs> the most profound truths are often the most simplest truths. And I think sometimes we look out at the world, and here's what we think. One of two things. One, the world is beyond saving. You ever look at the world and say, man, they're so bad, they can't get saved. Or we think something even worse. They're not worth saving. Mm. See, we got that. We got, mm. because we all said, I know I felt like that. Right, we may not say that. Like, see, we speak Christianese. We don't, we know enough never to say that out loud. But our actions show that's exactly what we believe. That either the world is beyond saving or they're not worth saving. Because we have no interest in going out and finding them to save them. See, that way of thinking is an insult to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It says the price he paid for their sins falls short of what's needed for forgiveness. I mean, I don't know about you, but the Bible says you could never out -sin the grace of God. And I just believe what the Bible says. But there's never a point that God looks at someone, ever, ever, and says they are not worth saving. Think about that for a minute. If there was somebody in this room right now who that could have happened to, it would be me. But yet in my filth, in my mess, God looked down and said, he is worth it. Someone go give him the gospel. He needs it. I died for him. So you may argue, man, that person just doesn't deserve God's grace. And what that tells me is you don't understand what grace is. Because grace is undeserved favor. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. That's why it's amazing. <laughs> That's why a slaveholder and a slave trader can write amazing grace. Because God wanted to save him. See, in this passage, Jesus is doing what Jesus does. And the more I read through this gospel so I can preach it and share what God is sharing with me, with all of you, is I realize how casual Jesus was and how formal we've made this. Oh, my word. Jesus walks around. And wherever he was, he did ministry. Right? He didn't have a million-dollar budget. I didn't have all these bells and whistles. Just walked around and talked to people. Ding, ding, ding. Like, it's such a simple thing. And Jesus is walking around. He's walking on the beach. He's preaching. He's teaching. And he sees someone. And once again, he simply invites them. Hey, come and follow me. But this time, it's not a fisherman. 
This time it's a tax collector. Now, his name was Levi. Anyone know what his other name is that we would know him by? Matthew. Matthew. This is Matthew the tax collector. Now, his invitation to come follow Jesus would have been highly controversial among the religious Jews. But it also would have been very complicated for Jesus' existing, existing disciples. I never picked up on this before, ever. This is why I encourage you guys, read the Bible cover to cover every year. You will learn something new every year. I never realized that Jesus was still doing ministry in the same area where he called Peter and Andrew, James and John. So guess who used to pay their taxes to this tax collector? The other four disciples. This is a complicated thing. And I'll tell you why. Because no one likes the IRS. <laughs> right? No one's like praising the institution you're paying taxes to. Like, no one writes that check with a good heart. Man, I hope the government uses this money wisely. <laughs> Sorry. Right? On some level, we understand that this would be complicated, but not really to the extent that this was amazing that God would pair these two together or these five together because tax collectors were the worst of the worst. They weren't just IRS agents. They were considered traitors to the Jewish people. They were not welcome in the synagogue or the temple. They were not welcome in a good, upstanding Jewish citizen's home. Period. No self-respecting Jew will be friends with a tax collector. Now, you think, you know, wow, that's kind of extreme. Like, I know, we all got to pay our taxes. Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. What's the big deal? There's like no moral equivalent for what a tax collector was to what we have today. I, mean, I grew up singing about a wee little man named Zacchaeus <laughs> up in a sycamore tree. Right? So I, I, but that wee little man like had really, really big issues. Like people wanted to kill him, assassinate him. They hated him. You see, the tax collectors were Jewish people appointed by the Romans to collect their taxes. So Rome ruled the Jewish people. And what they would do is they would tax all their subjects to fund their wars and to further oppress the people. So now you have a Jew collecting money from other Jews to give to a Roman who's going to use that money to oppress the Jews. Does that make sense? So like, I don't know, like I've said this to you, I think I said this to you, like Matthew was like if an IRS agent, a corrupt IRS agent, and a mafia boss had a baby. <laughs> right? That's a tax collector. Because the Romans, in order to buy their loyalty, said, you have to give me... 10,000 a month. This is your province. Give me 10. Whatever you get over 10 is yours. Right? It's, it's, it's an extortion. It's a, it's a racket. So Matthew is stealing from his own people to give money to people that are killing and oppressing his people. It was interesting is that Matthew's name, you know what it means? Gift of God. Oh my. So when his mama gave him a name, God already had something lined up for him. Guys, I'm going to give you a gift. It's called grace. I mean, at this point, we can make a case for the four fishermen, but we can't make a case for the goodness of a tax collector. And that's the point. You know, the crowd, they came to hear Jesus. But here's the thing. They went home unchanged. The crowd came to hear. Matthew heard Jesus and his heart changed. He left everything behind and followed him. That's the difference between a fan of Jesus right, or a follower of Jesus. God's grace is so amazing that when the worst sinner accepts it by faith, he saves them for all eternity. 
That's God's grace. It changes depraved lives. I know it changed mine. I hope you don't get tired of hearing about God's grace. I hope you don't forget how much you desperately need God's grace. Now, you might say this, which is what most people do, which is what I've done most of my life, which is, well, I'm not Matthew. I don't really identify with Matthew. I mean, I need grace, but I don't need as much grace. You ever say that to yourself? I mean, that person needs grace. I just need grace. <laughs> well, let's talk about it. Verse 15. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. <laughs> there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers, still today in this room. Amen. When the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they asked his disciples, you ready? Why does he eat with such scum? Whoa. Hello. See, real faith never forgets that even people who think they're the best of sinners, they still need God's mercy. They still need God's mercy. And let me tell you, eating at someone's house was a big deal within this cultural context. I know that one of the things that we've lost here in America over the past 20 years is like two things that I think are really sad that we've lost. One is Sunday dinner at grandma's house. No invitation needed, just be there. The other thing is family dinner. Like just getting around a table and being together and breaking some bread without anyone having a cell phone in their hands. <laughs> See, back in these times, if you ate at someone's house, what it signified right, was that you were willing to have a relationship with them. There was no rush. You went in, right? your feet were washed, you washed your hands, you sat down, the food <clears throat> was being made, you spent hours. No one was looking at their watch. <clears throat> Right? No one had something else to do. This was what they were doing. And so it was a big deal to have dinner at someone's house. It meant you were open to have a relationship with them. Now, Pharisees were the prominent religious group within Judaism during the time of Christ in the early church. So you had all these different groups, and you hear these words, and sometimes we interchange them. Right? So we have the Sadducees which they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were an interesting group. They were kind of the Jewish Supreme Court. So when like, there were issues among all the laws and complications, and people were fighting, it would kind of make its way up the chain. And you'd the scribes, the keepers of the law, and they'd copy it down and make sure everyone had what they needed. Then you had the Pharisees. They were like the boots on the ground, prominent religious leaders of their day among the Jewish people. They were well-educated. They were economically advantaged. Many of them served in prominent positions in their local synagogues. So I would say this. I think it would be fair for us to say they were upper middle class of Jewish society. They were the middle class and the upper middle class. They were well thought of. So for a Pharisee, even thinking of stopping and speaking to Matthew would have been unheard of. Matter of fact, they made rules among themselves that you were not allowed to do that. No one was allowed to even speak to him. See, the religious community does one thing really well. It makes a lot of rules to keep people out of their little club. Christians are the opposite. We're inviting everyone into relationship. But religion stiff arms people. See, we know that we need God's mercies every day because God's grace and mercy are two sides of the same exact coin. I don't know if you've ever heard these defined, but I want to give you the definitions this morning so you know what they are. Grace, as I've mentioned, is God giving you what you don't deserve. God giving you what you don't deserve. God's mercy ensures that you don't get what you do deserve. Two sides of the same coin, neither of which have anything to do with you. 
the best sinner to ever live without Jesus still goes straight to hell when they die. Can I say it any plainer than that? The Pharisees were the height of religion. They literally set up systems that made society work to their advantage. The Pharisees did not believe in showing mercy. You know what rule number one was for the Pharisees? Maintain social power. Sound familiar with the religious people today? It might. I mean, they were experts. They were like the Cobra Kai of religious dojos. Really, strike hard, strike fast, no mercy. That was the Pharisees. And here's the thing. We judge them. We judge them without realizing how much we resemble them. I want to say something else. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. The Pharisees will feel much more comfortable and welcome in the American church today than the disciples of Jesus Christ. Sink, let it sink in. If you want to punch me in the face, after service, I'll be in the back. <laughs> now, let me, let me show you why. Because some of you like are hearing me, and you like me. I'm your pastor. I hope you like me. Um, Ron doesn't like me, but he's here because he loves Jesus. <laughs> but, but deep down, you're almost like, all right, can we get past this? I'm not sure if I agree with this. Let me describe a Pharisee to you. Okay? They were good, law-abiding citizens who were raised in the church. They were pillars in their community. Their houses were in the suburbs, and they were well-kept. Their kids all went to the right schools, right? They donated to charity, and they were patriots who loved their nation. And Jesus is hanging out with the working class poor. Prostitutes, tax collectors, drunks, thieves from all different cultures. Just think about that for a minute. Jesus goes as far as to say in Luke 18, you don't have to write this, you don't have to turn in your Bibles, but write this down in your Bibles if you're taking notes. Luke 18, 9 through 14. It says, Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. So this is Jesus talking. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. So we're talking exactly about what this passage deals with. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, I thank God I am not like other people who are cheaters. Sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week, and I give God a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Church, I need you to hear me this morning. Pride and shame are equally offensive to God because one tells Jesus they're too good for the cross. And the other tells him they're too bad for the cross. So humility knows that it's not about you. It's all about what Jesus did for you. God's grace, God's mercy, that's what saved you. Not who you are. See, real faith knows you can give a 10% tithe to the church and be 100% lost. Real faith remembers, man, I need God's mercy every day. Do you need God's mercy every day? You're just crushing it. Who here doesn't need God's mercy? 
We won't raise our hand and admit that in church, but we'll live like it. See, Jesus sits with the, the sinners that society rejects. Right, the Pharisees were experts at comparing those. Did you hear the comparison of Luke 18? Thank God I'm not like Ron Frank. <laughs> right? Thank God I'm not like Dave Ambler. Man, I could really be bad off. But I've said this before, I'll say it again. Even Charles Manson could say, Thank God I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> right? The standard isn't another sinner, the standard is a savior. Now, when you stand next to Jesus, tell me how you're doing. And if you're not flat on your back in fear, then you might just not know who you're standing next to. See, Jesus sees outsiders, and he says, man, I could use you in my inner circle. Come in. Come in out of the cold. I love you. Religion acts like a doorman up in the club. I used to go to a club in the city called The Tunnel. Anybody go to The Tunnel? Repent. Just repent. <laughs> Why are you raising your hand? I, you know, like, I can't believe you raised your hand. So I used to go to this, this city, and I used to go to this club, and I used to hang with a crew, and we'd walk to the front door, and we would get let in. Meanwhile, the line was around the block, like rap, because you didn't just walk in. They didn't care how much money you had. They'd pick you off the line. Right? That's religion. Religion says they knew, the doorman knew I ran with the crew. I was one of them. You're one of us. Come on in. That's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't have a VIP list. He has an LIP list, the least important people are the most significant in his kingdom. Right? He's not a doorman, he is the door. Everyone's welcome to come in. It's narrow, but it's open. See, the Messiah came with a message of mercy for all mankind. We all need it. And then in verse 17, it says, When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. See, real faith doesn't forget its faults. It goes out finding other people because it remembers what it was like to be lost. Notice Jesus didn't say those who are righteous. He said those who think they are righteous, because the scriptures are clear. There are none righteous, no, not one. None follow after God. All fall short. All are depraved. Right? No matter how respectable you look this morning, I promise you, if I put the worst thing you ever did or the worst thing you ever thought up on that screen, you would run out of here screaming and you would never come back. <laughs> Definitely her. For sure her. We'll have to get a counseling session. Listen, no. Jesus is saying, listen, if you don't know you're sick, you don't go to a doctor. So religious people don't know how sick they are so they don't go to the one thing that can actually save them. The hardest person to reach with the gospel is someone who thinks they're a good person. Oh, it's so frustrating. <laughs> there are people in my life that I love. I'm talking blood, flesh and blood. My people. Love them. And they just don't hear me. It's like I'm talking to a wall. I mean, you know, talk about Jesus, and they talk about, well, I'm a good person. So Jesus, I, I was raised in the church. Talk about Jesus, I've been to VBS. Talking about Jesus, oh, well, I said a prayer. No, no, I'm talking about Jesus. The hardest person to reach is someone who thinks they're saved already, and their heart has not been transformed by Jesus Christ. So Jesus is just saying, hey, listen, let, let's set some ground rules here. Number one, you all might think you, you're good, but you're not. So let's make that clear. You're the best the world has to offer among sinners, and you still lose. But good news is I came to seek and save the lost. I am the great physician that can heal the sickest patient.
who's ever lived. This is why I'm here. Right? This is why his calling every time now has been come follow me and let's find more people. Right? It's not, he calls you specifically, but it's not specifically about you. I, I'm, I swear we've individualized the American faith. No other culture has ever done this but us. And it's not shocking, right? The Wild West, John Wayne, this is who we are. There's a lot of good there. Like, I love the pioneering spirit of America. I love, you know, going doing new things and personal responsibility and working hard. And all that resonates with me. But all that goes out the window with Jesus Christ. Right? We don't have an individual faith. We get saved individually into community. Which is why the American church stinks at multiplying. It's why we stink at making disciples. Because we've made it all about us. What am I getting out of this morning? Am I learning how to have a better marriage? Am I being a better person? Do I feel better about me? What am I learning? Am I being fed? Christian, you were sent on a spiritual search and rescue mission. A disciple who's not making disciples isn't a real disciple. It's inherent in your calling. It's built into the gospel. Don't get so redeemed that you no longer relate to lost people. I've seen people get too redeemed for their own good. So redeemed that they just don't relate to the sick world anymore. But if I saw your browser history, you might recognize how sick you are. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. He's he is the savior. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in this place. Listen, I've noticed there's an inverse relationship for us church people. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. So why don't you stop looking out there? Why don't we just start looking here for a minute? Right, the longer, longer we sit in these pews, right, the less we care about lost people. The more self-righteous we become. We get so focused on what goes on inside these four walls that we forget that God didn't call us here for just ourselves, but to reach the people in our community. Like, there's a fine line between fellowshipping with the faithful and forgetting about the fact that God has called us to reach the lost. I love a potluck like anybody else. But I love what we did last night. We just hung out around a fire and sang songs and made s'mores. And we had, man, we had kids running around. We had teenagers hanging out. We had older people just enjoying some fellowship. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's part of, right, the quantity of the fellowship of the God's people. And it's what helps form us and shape us and who God wants us to be. But if we never, ever get out in the community, we have failed at the most basic calling of our Christianity. That's how one day we wake up. It happens slowly over time. And we forget that we were on a seek and save mission. That we were a search and rescue team. And we got going out into the world and we start shooting prisoners of war. Instead of setting them free. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't like get saved and start hating lost people. It's after 10 or 15 years of building your own self-righteousness. Right? You know a little bit more about the Bible, but your heart isn't any more transformed. Our real faith goes out looking for the lost. It's part of who we are. If you're taking notes, I'm going to close with this. Just write down Luke 15. This is the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but, but I do think it speaks directly to what Jesus is saying here this morning. So if you're not familiar with the story, let me give you a recap. The prodigal son involves not one son, but two sons. And their father is fairly wealthy. He's a successful guy. He's done well. And his younger son, like he's just tired of all these rules and hard work. And anyone here grew up on a farm or a ranch? This is Long Island. So, okay, that's fair. <laughs> okay. But it's hard work. You're getting up early every day. It never ends. Right, so the younger son is like, you know what? I'm at, like, I don't need this. So, Dad, do me a favor. I don't want to wait till you die 
to be rid of you. So if you could just give me my half now, I could just leave you, we'll all be happy. And the dad says, you know what? All right, take your inheritance and go. That's what you want. I'm not gonna force you. See, I told you you needed counseling. You want it? You're the bad son in the scenario. It's a lot going on in this front row. Now the older son is the good one. Right? He works hard. He gets up early. He does what his father says. He's going to earn it the right way. He's going to work hard. He wants his inheritance. And then one day, the younger son blows all the money, right? And he decides, I need to come home. Like, my, I, I know my dad. I've mistreated my dad, but at the very least, he'll let me serve him as one of the servants. I got to come back. The world is eaten me up and has spit me out. I am ready to get humble. And he comes home. And he's not even at the house yet. His father sees him coming. And he comes sprinting out the house. My son. And he goes, y'all, kill the fatted calf. We're having a party. My son is home. And now I grew up focusing on the lost son. My whole life. Every Sunday school class. Every VBS. Every sermon going, man, how lucky was that young son that that, that God, his father had so much grace on him. He was so lost. And then I grew up. You know what I realized? The older son was just as lost. He followed the rules. He was real religious. But he didn't love his father the way he was supposed to either. He was following the rules to try to get his father's stuff. It wasn't about love. It was about earning his way in. Christian, I need you to hear me. The Pharisees and the tax collectors were equally lost. Your cousin, who might be shooting dope somewhere in Brooklyn this morning, right? Right, your sister-in-law that maybe had 14 affairs, you know, that, that guy you know that's living dirty, right? They're lost, but so is your brother who's been faithful and worked for 20 years and goes to church but doesn't know Jesus. They're both equally in need of God's grace and mercy, and I know what's within you is what's within me. So you push back a little, go, wait a second, no. No, 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 no. One needs it more. No, they both need it equally. We all need God's grace. We all need God's mercy. Don't deceive yourself into thinking you deserve anything because you don't. And I'm not putting you down. I'm giving you a reason to have gratitude. You forget how jacked up you are. So you're not grateful that Jesus saved you anymore. You got a good button up shirt and a big Bible. Okay? Not impressed. All right, Matthew 7, 21 through 25. I'm going to keep saying it. To, like, I want to make sure everyone hears it because I want to be held blameless when I stand before the throne. These are religious people. These are the Pharisees. These are the church people who show up to heaven. And they're like, ah, here, let's party. And Jesus is like, yeah, you're not on the list. I'm like, what? what do you mean? You're the door. He's like, yeah, you never walk through. You were so busy in VBS and giving this money and serving here and being a good person, you missed that you needed the good news. And they actually argue with Jesus. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. I I was a deacon. I was was a pastor. He'd be like, nope. Not in the book of life. Not in the list. You were on the the law. So now let's look at what you did compared to my standard and see what you deserve. God doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. Faith knows that the worst and the best of sinners need God's grace and mercy. We don't forget our faults. We don't get self-righteous. So we always go out looking for the lost. Let's pray. As the piano plays, I'm just going to ask a few quick questions. And if this is new to you, Um, nothing weird is happening. We're just engaging 
with the word of God. So everyone would just bow their heads and close their eyes. If you want to hold your pocketbook tighter, go ahead. <laughs> That's good. There are some sinners up in here. 20 years ago, I would have took it and bounced. <laughs> so here we are in God's house. Right? We're God's people. But yet we don't live the way he calls us to live. And maybe you've heard about Jesus, you've heard about God, and you're kind of a fan, and that's why you're here. You're searching, and dude, I'm so glad you're here. Like, what courage it is to walk into a place searching. But maybe there's a piece of you that says, man, I'm just like the worst of the worst. Like, I'm, I resonate with Matthew. I'm the tax collector. Like, I, I'm just, I've done some dirt. You don't know, Pastor Mike. I wouldn't even tell you. And you think that the shed blood of Jesus Christ isn't strong enough to save you. And I'm going to tell you this morning, you are wrong. Jesus saw you in your worst moment and said, man, I want to say, I'm going to die for them. Right now, I'm going to die for them. His love for you kept him on the cross because he has paid the price. And all you have to do is accept the gift. So maybe you're here this morning Oh, actually, let me say this. Or maybe it's the other side. Maybe you realize this morning that you're a good religious person. But you've still never trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation. You know that. Because when I talk about being saved, you start thinking about how much you deserve it and how bad everyone else is. And you really struggle. And you're a good middle-class citizen and you pay your taxes and you raise your kids and you know, you serve on the PTA, and you know what? None of that gets you into heaven. And you even thought, well, I'm good, so therefore it's the gospel plus my goodness. This morning, I invite you to repent of that. So whether you think you're too bad for the gospel or too good for the gospel, you can both be saved this morning by praying the same prayer to the same Savior, and the same God will save you. The same Holy Spirit will indwell you. And you say, Father... I've tried to be good, but I know it's not good enough. And I've done some bad. And other sin has consequences. So this morning, regardless of who I am, my goodness, my badness, I admit that I am fully lost, and I am placing my faith in Jesus Christ this morning, right now, to save me from my sins. Jesus has invited me this morning to follow him. And I'm the lost person who got found this morning. If that's you, nobody's looking. Would you slip your hand up and slip it down so I can see you? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Went up and down quick, but I saw it. I see that as well. If you're online, put a hand emoji. Now, here's the thing. I want to celebrate with you. I don't want to embarrass you. No one's going to know. But if you would just fill out a card before you leave and put it in one of the boxes, it'll be on my desk tomorrow morning. And just put the word gospel and your name and your number. And I just want to get to know you and celebrate with you. I have a gift for you that's going to help you walk the way Jesus walked. Father, you are gracious and kind. You are gracious on our best days. You are merciful on our worst. You are a good father. And we need you this morning. So thank you for doing what we could not do, which is sending your son to save us from our sins. Thank you for your word, Lord, that we get to preach this and teach this and learn from this. And what a breakfast we had this morning, feasting on your word. Father, I pray that it would change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello. Okay. So this song is called Alabaster Heart. And I wanted to speak before it because I never knew what it meant. I would sing it. I'm like, okay. Whatever an alabaster heart is, I'm pretty sure I have it. I don't know what it is, but I probably have it. Whatever. So I started looking into the meaning of the song because some of the lyrics that I did understand were so powerful. And the songwriter said, trust God with all that we give him and 
sing that part again you can have it all can we just sing that it's just hard to go to announcements I'm sorry I apologize Pastor Mike can we just sing that can we just sing that all my heart all my love all my own you can have it all all my heart all my soul all my own you can have it all all my heart all my love all my love, you can have it all. All my, all my love, all my love, you can have it all. Oh, oh you can have it all. 
Oh, we give you everything, God. You can have it all. You can have my mind. You can have my heart. You can have my dreams. You can have it all. You can have everything I've accomplished, God. You can have it all. 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 all. I got to stop before I get in trouble. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Eric Lewis. I serve here as one of the leaders. It is announcements time. You can briefly take your seats because if not, we can just go right up and worship and keep singing and get lost. And I don't want to get in trouble for that. <laughs> Let's get lost. Oh, Jesus. Wow. Oh, God. If you know someone who was lost, if you know someone who is sick, if you know someone who needs to experience the grace, the mercy of God, and the great physician, we ask that you like, we ask that you share. This message today by our website, our Facebook page, and even YouTube. If you would like to connect with us here at Cornerstone Bible Church, please write down the following number. 631-201-5520 and save it to your phone as cornerstone if you want it to be added to our text list please text church all other ways that you can interact with us are listed on the slides all weekly event and ministry information it's located on our app you can find it in the app store and download it by looking up Church Center, entering in the zip code, and choosing Cornerstone. Here are a few highlighted announcements. October 15th at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., we'll be having what is known as homecoming. During that time, we'll be giving out eight ounce bottles to those that will be passing down, um, playing their instruments in the high school and people within the community. So we ask that if you can, if you would be so kind to donate some eight ounce water bottles. October 22nd, we ask that you sign up in the back for a great night. One of the things that we've learned to do is to have dinner with each other again right and one of the ways that we can do that thank you Matt Krantz and your wife is through our breaking bread ministry if you're interested in being a guest please see him or his wife in the back our next steps class will be our new members class next week at 12:30 p.m. after church at this point or at this moment we're going to call our brother Brian and Toreen Simonis at this time such peace. 
pure joy. So many smiles, the children just become wild and crazy. It's undescribable. To watch that child open that box for the very first time and see the look on their faces, and it's amazing that God used a simple shoebox to bring that much joy. This is amazing, as you can see, the children's faces, they're excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. Thank you. We are very happy. God bless you. Yay! These people back behind us, they're giving their time. Families have given boxes. Their enthusiasm, the excitement, it's off the charts. We're just so thankful for these volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. They are the heart of the ministry. And because of them, many children, like even me, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. What children need more than anything is love, hope, and faith in God. Every shoebox gift is an opportunity to share your faith. We thank you for this ministry that is yours that you use a shoebox gift to go around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts with a simple shoebox gift, and from there, these gifts go around the world and are given to each child. It could be in a pickup truck, it could be at the top of a bus, the roof of a taxi, camels and donkeys, canoes going up the river, whatever it takes to get these gifts into the hands of children. And that's only the beginning. After children receive the box, they get to go through a 12-lesson discipleship course. And these children, they're committing their lives to Christ. And they get to share their faith with other children. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. My name is Romina Alejandra. I really like to draw and cook. One day, I was drawing and I wanted some markers. And I asked my mother if she could buy them for me. She said no, because she didn't have the money. Today, we received gift boxes. When I opened the box and saw the markers, I was very excited. I learned about God through the box. Today, I prayed that Jesus come into my heart. I am very grateful to everyone, to God and to you all for bringing me this box. This box provides the opportunity to put a smile on a child's face, gets them to know more about Jesus Christ, and also be disciples so that they can be disciple makers in the world. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We have seen churches being planted. We have seen people being transformed. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is incredible. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. I grew up in. Um, we're gonna. You can take a box. We're gonna have 30 boxes in the back. If you just like to fill a box, uh, but the main goal is for the kids in the children's church to be able to fill 70 of them. So we have some cards in the back for donations that you could uh, send in. Uh, and the other option we have is.
So the boxes are going to be in the back. Um, if the church is over, we're back at the one table back there. Like um, we were saying, we have about 30 of them that we've allocated for individual families to take. And there's also the cards for the donations. When you take a box, um, you're going to fill it based on whether it's for a boy or a girl. And for an age group, you're going to see on the box there's a label kind of lays it out. And there's also suggested things to put inside the box. So you're going to take a label, you're going to take a box, and you're going to take a, a list of ideas of items to put inside of it if you choose to fill your own box. Or you're going to take the card. We're going to ask that you buy the items on the card, on the index card, and bring them back by the due date that's on there so that we can fill those boxes in Children's Church. Our children can fill those boxes to be distributed to these kids around the world. Um, lastly, we're going to be filling the boxes on November 6th in Children's Church, so we would appreciate it if you could get all the supplies in by um, October 30th, which is a week before, just so we could have everything prepared and ready. If you take your own box, you don't have to bring it back until the November 6th because um, collection is soon after that so that they have time to distribute the boxes all around the world. Um, we also ask that if you take a box, you just pray for it. Pray that it reaches the right child. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for your help. At this point, we have reached the conclusion of our service. And on behalf of our pastor, Michael Rabino, and the leadership team here, we would like to say thank you for worshiping with us. Those that are here in person, those that are watching us online, we ask that you all stand as we get ready to pray and exit out. If you need prayer, if you need prayer, there are prayer partners that will pray with you that will intercede with you. If you're online and you need prayer, please text prayer. Let's go before the throne of God. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, God, that we sent your spirit. We sent your presence on today. Thank you, God, for the words that we were able to utter in, the, in singing and praise and worship. Our prayer, God, today that you would accept our praise and worship as a sweet smelling savior and as our pastor said we felt your stamp of approval it was something different in this place it was something unique in this place God we thank you God because as our pastor said we don't come for a religious experience God but we come to encounter your presence we come God to hear your word God we talked about the lost God we talked about those who are sick God but this week, God, we pray, God, that we would get lost. <laughs> We would get lost in your presence. We would get lost, God, in you because we're grateful, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love because we were once lost as well. We were once sinking in the ship, God, but you came and got us. I got to end this prayer. Father, we thank you. We love you. We bless you. God, keep us. Help us to always remember you. Help us to always remember you and remember those who are lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.